Hello, folks. This is your host, Tammy Tucky, and you are now listening to the Tierra Talk Show. We bring you rare interviews with the makers of Disney Magic. Whether they be singers, actors, Imagineers, animators, they have all made their mark on the Disney name. Be sure to check out the show notes, other episodes, contests, our social media pages from Facebook to Twitter, and more on our official website at www.thetierratalkshow.com. Are you looking to plan and book an upcoming Disney vacation? Contact the Tierra Talk Show's official travel agent, James from Destinations in Florida, by visiting destinationsinflorida.com backslash tiara for a free quote. The link is also included in the show notes on our website. All guest opinions are theirs and theirs alone and do not represent the opinions of the Tierra Talk Show or the host. The Tierra Talk Show is not associated with the Disney Company. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode. And from all of us here at the Tierra Talk Show, have a hoop de doo day. I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, director Gary Drowsdale, to the show. Welcome, Gary. Hi. It's wonderful to have you back on the show. We had you maybe, la- I think it was last year, as a surprise guest for uh, Jerry Reese's uh, show uh, where we talked about uh, Cranium Command. So that was so much fun. I- oh, that was, it, was, it, was a, it was a pleasure. It was fun talking to Jerry again. That was one of your first projects in which you directed a certain uh, portion of a film slash attraction, which was uh, Cranium Command. I think that was along with Kirk Wise, correct? Absolutely right. And then right after that, it was Beauty and the Beast, and soon after, Hunchback of Notre Dame. And then you're coming from Hunchback of Notre Dame into Atlantis, which is celebrating its 15th anniversary this coming year. It's unbelievable. Oh, isn't that isn't that strange to think that 2001 was 15 years ago? <laughs> it does. It does feel really weird until I look in the mirror and go, oh, yeah, great hair. Yeah. Oh, no, you look fabulous, Gary. Goodness gracious. Now, Aren't you nice? <laughs> well, now, can you tell me about that first pitch meeting? Or well, just... I mean, it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't come real easily, you know, to, to like, hey, let's do Atlantis. It was, um, um, it, it, it was, it was kind of the result of uh, Don Hahn and Kirk Wise and myself coming off of, of uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame and saying, you know, we've actually done two things that worked out okay. And the studio more or less likes us. They trust us as much as they're going to trust anybody at this point, um, which is no small thing, you know, because they don't trust anybody. So, um, Don suggested, you know, if we don't want to be put on something, you know, if we, if we don't want to be like just shoehorned into something, we should think of something ourselves. We should like put our heads together and just, think of what we want to do and present that to the studio. That was like one of the first things is like, let's do something that isn't a musical. Well, what do you want to do? Well, you know, Disney had those great like live action things back in the sixties, even the fifties, you know, where like 20,000 leagues into the sea and Swiss family Robinson, all these like adventure things that we remembered as kids and we said, well, that, you know, what if we do something like that? You know, the, like the journey to the center of the earth, the Jules Verne stuff. Hey, Jules Verne, what a great idea. And so we all read Jules Verne, um, journey to the center of the earth and concluded it's really not that exciting. You know, it's a lot of like blundering around in the dark and not finding really anything. And they never get to where they're going and then they leave. And we thought, well, let's, let's, let's spice this up. And, the popular tale is that the Don and Kirk and our writer, uh, Tad Murphy and myself sat down in a Mexican restaurant over lots of like guacamole and chips and, and came up with a story. And it's the popular story because it's mostly true. You know, that's, that's basically what we did. And, you know, we spent, I don't know, four or five hours at a little restaurant in Burbank and said, well, what do we do? You know, what do, what do we find down there? What is, what about, I don't know, we go to the center of the earth. Well, what is at the center of the earth? I, I don't even remember who it was. Probably Tab, but, but it could have been any of us. Might have been Don and said, what if they find Atlantis? What if they find the lost city of Atlantis? And it kind of spun out from there, you know, and then, and, um, the, you know, the pitch to the studio, I think we relied heavily on the, you know, Disney, Disney tradition, the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the, you know, the, the old, like, classic Walt live action stuff. And this is very much in the Disney canon to do this. We've just never done it in animation. And 
frankly, you've been, you, the studio, have been looking for something a little different. You know, the, the studio themselves were, were thinking, we're, we're falling into a little bit of a rut. It's a successful rut, but it's a little bit of a rut of doing, you know, the, the musicals over and over. It did, it served us very well for a while, but, you know, the audiences were going, all right, what else you got now? Um, cause you know, other, other studios were starting to come out with things and we said, all right, we should uh, DreamWorks, for instance, they were doing the Shrek stuff and th- those were not musicals and they were different and edgy. And, and we thought, well, we should probably maybe think of something else. This originally did not come with the characters. The characters were soon after because you have to go into a deep development of them along with the story, correct? Right. I can't remember. It was probably Tab, the, the writer, who, who came upon the idea, well, you know, what if it's, you know, what if it's led by, like, a, a historian, you know, then cartographer, map maker. Um, and, we, you know, it's the Disney kind of classic thing to make, make your main character a little bit out of the mold, a little bit, a little bit out of the ordinary, a little bit kind of off the beaten path, you know, a, a little bit outcast. So he's he he doesn't quite fit in, but he's you know confident in himself more or less, confident in his knowledge. Um, so Milo kind of came from that, um, and Michael J. Fox played a large role in just defining you know when we said oh he'd he'd be great at this, and then we kind of wrote it for him, and it, you know it 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 developed because of Michael J. Fox as well, you know because he was he was our he was our Milo. We began writing for him. Uh, well, you know, how would he say it? You know, what, what would be, what are his kind of traits and personality bits that that can translate into Milo? And it, they seem to mesh really nicely. As far as, um, uh, you know, like you say, the, the the ensemble cast. We said from the beginning, well, it'd be great if we had an ensemble cast. You know, the the Seven Samurai, Dirty Dozen kind of. You know, let's let's get a bunch of guys in there, and and because it's an ensemble because Disney seemed very shy about doing this, let's make it really diverse. And men, women, um, uh, different ages, different races. Um, and so, yeah, so that's what we put forward. And, we, you know, we didn't really negotiate that. We just, we just wrote it in, so let's do it. And um, I, I, I believe Tab wrote them, and then, you know, the, the story guys got them. And, and when story guys get a hold of a script, things always, you know, they, they kind of spiral out, you know, in a crazy way. Um and then the animators, they'll, they'll get a crack at them, and, and new quirks and, and uh, tweaks will, will become apparent. So it's, it's an evolutionary process. And how is that audition process like for you to find the right voice? Because I can't even imagine, you know, we're, the people who watch these films, we're just used to, you know, certain individuals voicing these characters. But when you're in the process of finding that voice, it, it I, I remember either hearing or reading that it's like you have to, you're usually looking down and not at the person and just right. listening to the voice and seeing if it works well with the drawing that's in front of you. So yeah, exactly right. And that's, and it's kind of hard to do when you when you've got somebody you know who who you know who they are. It's like and you're a fan of their work, and you want to you want to watch them at the mic. You want to you know make eye contact and go hi. Um, but um, you also have to be faithful to your character on the on the piece of paper in front of you, the, the drawing. And, and if you can hear that voice coming out of that character, yeah, it's hard. And it's it's also hard for the actors because because they're there usually dressed up. You know, like they're kind of dressed to to, to succeed, and and um, uh, you know they're on their good behavior, and they they want to make an impression too. And they see this this table of you know directors and producers with kind of like visors on, or you know like shading their eyes and looking straight down, not not making eye contact at all. So it's a little weird for them as well. But uh, but but that's it. You know that's that's what we that's what we do. And our casting director. They play an enormous role in, looking, in you know, looking at the drawings and hearing the character descriptions and going, okay, I think I might have a few people who you can listen to, and we'll listen to three people, we'll listen to ten people. Um, I don't remember what the record was on Atlanta. So many people. Sometimes it was like, oh, I got the person, per- the perfect person for you, Jim Varney as Cookie. We went, okay, yeah, that sounds good, and and boom, you know, that was it. But like Florence Stanley, we're like. Well, she, she's really funny, and you know she's got a great voice. And I know we read other uh, we read other actresses, but when we heard Florence, we said, "Oh, she's just perfect." Uh, Phil Morris was the same way. He was he was somebody that 
I only knew him as as uh, Jackie Childs from um, uh, from Seinfeld. And when he came in, instead of in this um, um, you know this lawyer suit and you know all, all buttoned down and and, and kind of um, kind of hyperactive, he was like casual and and uh, and cool and jeans and a t-shirt and like all the girls were like. Oh my God! You know they're just like falling all over him, and he was like the nicest guy. It, it was like Clark Kent and Superman. You know he puts on the glasses and he turns into Jackie Childs, and then he takes them off. He's he's like normal guy, and he was terrific. And again, the voice was like that's him. The, you know why look anymore? However, I will I will point it out at this point. After the movie had come out, and we had the artwork up on the walls. They were touring Michael Clark Duncan around the studio for something, and he he saw the the, the pictures of Doctor Sweet and he said, "What the hell, man? Why, why didn't you pick me? I even look like the guy." And we went, "Oh, well, shoot, we didn't. <laughs> we couldn't <didn't> now." <laughs> when you're going for Michael J. Fox to voice Milo, and he's just known across the board for Back to the Future and Family Ties, how are you sending him in like a note or 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 maybe a, an animation drawing of Milo and saying, "Would you?" consider auditioning for this or how does that process work i don't know if we actually auditioned michael or if if we i think he was one of the ones that we said if if we ask if we ask for michael j fox you know if, if we contact him it's either we're gonna you know we offer him the part or we don't you know it's it's it, i don't think it was an audition thing um i'm pretty sure that uh john pomeroy who was the lead uh the lead animator on Milo, I, you know, did send drawings, and I believe we, we offered him the part. We said he sounds like he'd be perfect. We love Michael J. Fox. You know, he's he's got a great he's got a great voice. Um, he's got a great character. We think he'd be perfect. Let's just offer him the part. And unfortunately, within the past two years, we uh, th- we lost another Atlantis crew member, uh, James Garner, who voices uh, yeah. Lieutenant Rourke. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about adding him to the process and, and how he worked uh, on this film as a character? And spoiler alert, I hope people have seen this film before we talk before we're talking about it. But, you know, he is a good guy in the beginning and not so good at the end. So, you that's, know, yeah, well, that's that's one of the things we wanted. We wanted uh, we wanted a character that was a villain that wasn't apparently a villain, you know, that, that we, we wanted him to be kind of rough around the edges, but be charming and charismatic and be somebody that you didn't identify as, Oh, that's, that's the villain right there. Um, Scar, of course he's a villain. Gaston, absolutely the villain. Uh, Rourke, I don't know. He's kind of, kind of a hard ass, but, um, don't know. There might be another villain, you know, and and then when he turns, we felt that would be better. And James Garner was absolutely perfect for that because he's such such a warm and you know, uh, you know, friendly kind of voice with that that kind of lovable curmudgeon, um, you know, kind of overlay to his voice, which is kind of how he is or was. You know, he was this. He would come in and and you know he would. He didn't cut us any slack. He was he was he was a lot of fun, but he was absolutely lovable, an absolute gentleman. Another person who passed away too, uh, Leonard yeah. Nimoy. He was perfect because I think you said in the behind the scenes feature that you were looking for someone that sounded thousands of years old. Now Leonard Nimoy can do a very very good uh, vocal uh, presentation of that. He's he's somebody else who was he was um, uh, he, he was like the consummate professional. You know he would he would come in. If the recording session was at 11 a.m., he would be there at 11 a.m. If if it was 11.02 and he wasn't there, we were calling Highway Patrol and the local hospitals. You know, I'd be like, what happened? Where, where, where is it? Because he was that punctual, and he'd come in, and, you know, he he didn't, he didn't you know, like, mess around with the script or, you know, like, try and argue or, you know, anything like that. He'd just like, all right, how do you want me to do this? I think I could try this, and you know the the dialect that when they were speaking the Atlantean, we had a dialect coach for him, and he just like picked it up like that. I guess being a native Vulcan speaker, you get you pick up languages. <laughs> so, so yeah, he was really good, and just just being able to meet him was like, oh, this is so cool. So Don Hahn was also a producer on this. It was kind of like a, I'd say you guys were the three amigos, Kirk, uh, Don, and you. And you guys, you know, came out with Beauty and the Beast, Hunchback, and Atlantis. Um, Don's been working on some of the live action remakes or extensions from some of the original animated Disney films, like Maleficent and up and coming Beauty and the Beast. So uh-huh. if there was a possibility 
that they would decide to transfer it to the big screen again as a live action film. Is there anyone in particular that you would like to see portray some of the characters? God, I don't have to think about that. Picking, picking the, uh, you know, getting the voice and matching it to a drawing is one thing, but, but finding a live actor who can pull that off and, you know, to your satisfaction. And I'm notoriously picky on some things like that. Um, I would really have to think about that. Now, the premiere of Atlantis, I remember you told a, a funny story to me a couple of years ago about uh, hanging out with Michael J. Fox after the premiere or before it. Okay, well, there, there, there's a two-part thing, because um, we took Atlantis to show West in Las Vegas, which is the big, um, the, the big dog and pony show that the, all the studios do to all the theater owners, or at least they used to. I don't know if they still do it or not. I, I can't imagine why they wouldn't. But theater, uh, theater owners from across the country would descend upon Las Vegas for like a week. And all the, all the studios would, would do this huge extravaganza show to convince theater owners that their movies are great and they should put it in theaters and hold it there forever. You know, and everybody would make money and it would be great. Um, and so we had a show with Michael J. Fox with a scaled back version of Cirque du Soleil. So, um, it was, it was their, uh, I think it's called, Oh, their water show. And at the end of the show, they had these, the, the, the tank of water in this stage was such that people could dive into it and swim through it, and you could also walk across it. They had platforms that would raise and lower invisibly, and you couldn't tell they were there until somebody was, like, walking on the water. So at the end of the show, Michael, Michael and two of the girls, like, just came walking from the distance towards this, you know, towards the, the, the audience and waved and posed for pictures, and the audience went crazy. So after that, um, we went gambling which was, you know, like one of the high points of my career and life. So, you know, this is like my best Hollywood story ever. It's like I got to go, I got to go gambling, at, at, you know, in, in Las Vegas with Michael J. Fox. But, I, you know, I'm not good at it. I don't like gambling. I'm not good at gambling. And he, he was having fun, you know, and he, he was there to win. Um, I maxed out my ATM card and burned through it in probably an hour, you know. And when I left... He said, oh, you're leaving already? And, you know, I'm just getting warmed up. It's like, oh, man, you know, I can't. I'm out of money, and I don't, you know, I'm not going to ask you for money, obviously, and, and I can't. I'm really sorry, but thanks, and okay, cheers. So it was later at, I guess, the premiere, and we were, everybody was posing for pictures um, out in front of the El Capitan in Hollywood, and uh, it's like, smile for the camera, everybody wave, everybody get together. And as the picture was over and everybody's kind of breaking up, he turns to me and goes, oh, man, you should have stuck around um, uh, in Vegas. He ended up winning like 60 grand. <laughs> this guy knows his stuff. He knows how to do it. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the latest projects you've been working on since Atlantis? Because I know you've been working on some things uh, with DreamWorks. And Mostly now. I, I, I've been at DreamWorks for going on 13 years now and I, I've, I've done mostly storyboards and short projects for them like like uh, TV shorts um, I did a, a couple uh, Shrek holiday specials uh, there's like a Shrek Christmas special which is probably coming up like in the next week or two since then um, I got put on to a project with um, gosh I can't remember how it came about uh, but but me and another guy were, were uh, uh, we were kind of free at the moment, and we're asked, "Would you guys, um, would you guys help us out with writing uh, some theme park stuff?" And my feeling was, there's a Venn diagram somewhere that said, "People who have worked on Shrek before on, in one, and people who have worked on like a haunted house." And I ended up in both circles. So, so we got started on that. It, it turned out to be pretty successful, and I've been doing rides and theme parks. Sense. So that's kind of what I've been up to. I've, I've accidentally turned into an Imagineer. I have three Disney questions I always ask my guests. I always end the show with them. So uh, I call them the Fab Three. So we'll uh -huh. start with the uh, Donald question, which is, as a child, what Disney film was one of your favorites to watch? I believe it was Sleeping Beauty, I think. Artistically, as a kid, artistically, I was, I was blown away. You know, I, I wasn't looking at the... Uh, I wasn't looking at the, you know, the story and the characters and the jokes. I was looking at the color palette and the design, and you know, which is for an eleven-year-old, that's nuts. But yeah, I, I thought it was just fantastic. 
And our goofy question, what Disney character do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? And you can choose an Atlantis crew member and uh, another Disney character from uh, outside the Atlantis universe. It would either be Dr. Sweet because he's like the most personable guy. Um, outside, I got to say Goofy. You know, you, you, you ask a Goofy question, they give you a Goofy answer, it's Goofy. And our Mickey question, if I ask you to name any Disney song at this very moment, what immediately comes to mind? Be our guest. Thank you again, Gary, for coming on the show. Happy 15th anniversary. I wish I could oh, you, bake Jeremy. a cake <laughs> and yeah. send it to you. Is there anything you'd like to say to the fans before we close out? Thank, thanks for uh, thanks for paying attention and and uh, you know keep it, keeping us going. It's 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 the fans that are faithful or or discovering us after all these years that you know that really make it all worth it. Took the L from the motor pool sign. Ha ha, we are all very amused.